Praise the Lord. In fact, to understand it, if we don't understand it, we won't be saved. Because the whole doctrine of justification deals with salvation and how to be right with the Lord. So that's the importance of it. Okay, go to Romans chapter 4, please. And I'll begin reading there in verse 1. I have put together a 45-slide presentation. And uh, so that shows you the level of just knowledge and importance of this doctrine. And I pray that you'll pray for me as I seek to teach it. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? <clears throat> for if Abraham were justified, say justified, by the work, <clears throat> by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Amen. See the term justified. Now, some somebody, I don't know who coined the term, but <clears throat> I think it's a good way to explain justified or justification. It's like just if I'd never sinned. So justified, just if just as if I had never sinned. It's a very good uh, I think way to put it. But the Bible says again verse two, for if Abraham <clears throat> were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, or justification, or right standing. Okay, synonymous basically. Verse 3, For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. There it is again, the term justifieth, the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. So you see imputation there. You see the word counted for righteousness. See the term believing, okay, very important. You'd be surprised how many people debate these things, okay. Uh, again, verse 6, even as David also described the blessedness of a man unto, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. Give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. So we're in biblical doctrines, the doctrine of salvation, particularly uh, the term justification. Amen. Let's look at definitions first. So we talk about justification is how to be right with God or the term righteousness, how to be right with God or how to be saved. So justification, this is uh, an English word we, we read in the Bible, of course, justification, right? How to be right with God. It is a legal term in the courtroom. So you talked about justification or being right with God, you're moving into the courtroom with that term. And we'll get into other relational relationship issues in relationship to the term. But so you'll understand, you see that picture of a judge? Okay, so it's a legal term. Justification. Now, what does a judge focus on if you go to the courtroom? Well, guilt and not guilt. That's where the judge is, right? So you got these attorneys that come, you got prosecuting attorneys. You have defense attorneys, and they present the case. And then once the person is determined either to be guilty or not guilty, that's where the judge steps in. So the judge particularly then in a court of law is focusing on whether or not the person is guilty or they're not guilty. So when we talk about the court of law, justification means that you are looked at as no longer being guilty in the eyes of the judge. Okay? 
So again, the legal term becoming righteous <clears throat> or justified. Now, Hebrew and Greek definitions we have here. Uh, the Hebrew word is zadik. And then we have the Greek word uh, dikaiosuni. Dikaiosuni is the way to say that. That's a big old long word, isn't it? Dikaiosune, and then the Hebrew word zadik. Behind these words, the Hebrew word and the Greek word means this. It means fairness, righteousness, justice, living up to a standard, meeting the needs of or expectations met. Those are all words behind uh, the Hebrew word zadik and dikai osune. So I'll give you a little bit of time if you're taking notes. So we're talking about then fairness, rightness, justice, living up to a standard, meeting the needs of or the expectations are met. That's basically what are the words behind uh, Zadik and Dikai Osuni. Okay, got that? We look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. The Bible says, Who was delivered for our offenses and raised for, again, for our justification. So the first scripture we're talking about from Paul. We're going to look at three of them. First scripture from Paul, Romans 4.25 says he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So Jesus, the Bible is telling us here, of course, that Jesus is the one who was crucified because of our sin. And then he was raised again for our justification. So two things are going on. His death is what allows the judge God to look at us in a court of law. We have broken the law of God. So if we're standing in the court based on whether or not we've kept the law of God or not, we have it. So the judge would say guilty. So Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood so that the righteous demands of the law could be satisfied. Number one. His resurrection, however, makes that effective. Because if he died and did not rise from the dead, his death would not be effective. So his death again pays the righteous demands of the law. The law has been broken. So he had to pay that price for the broken law. First of all. Number two, the resurrection makes his death effective in the court of God. So we find out very quickly that he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So both of those work together. Romans chapter 5 verse 16 through 18, Paul's going to talk about justification in two other verses here. Uh, we're going to see the term itself in two other verses. Verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, who's that? That's Adam. So Adam is the one that plunged the human race into a fallen state. So and not as by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. So what do we have in Adam? Because they sinned in the garden, we have condemnation through Adam. We have a fallen nature inside of us. But the free gift of many offenses unto justification. Jesus Christ brings us justification instead of condemnation. So again, verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification justification again to be right with God right standing etc verse 17 for if by one man's offense death reigned by one that's Adam much more they which receive abundance of grace say grace again unmerited favor of God grace is God's unmerited favor or God's enabling power so for if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more they which received abundance of grace, unmerited favor, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. All right? Dekaiosune is the Greek word that's being used here. If you go back to the Hebrew, it'd be Zadik. For by one man's of his death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace. And of the gift of righteousness. So right standing comes as a gift from God. 
Amen. Shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So what he did is what allows us to be in right standing with God. Because again, he paid the righteous demands of a broken law in his death. He rose again the third day, which makes his death effective. And so a gift has been given to us by his grace. We didn't merit it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it by working for it. It's something that he did for us based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon who? All men unto justification of life. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved because there has to be a response of faith to that, to that gospel message. But it is important for you to see that this free gift of righteousness, right standing with God, came upon all men unto justification of life. It's very important because when we get later into the, to the lesson, you're going to see a doctrine by Calvin that's called predestination. And that is that God has predestined some to hell and predestined some uh, to eternal life. But not everybody has the opportunity to be saved. We'll get into that later. So we see things here that are very, very important. We see condemnation came through Adam. Judgment came through Adam. We see that through Jesus Christ, by grace, we, see, we receive a gift of right standing with the Lord. Amen? So the righteousness of one, through him the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did for us, are you all able to see that? Okay. I'm going to try not to spend so much time looking at that. I'm going to look at this. The Lord Jesus Christ, so what he did for us led to the ultimate making right or the meeting of expectations for the believer in his death, his life, his resurrection. He accomplished this on behalf of the believer. This is why this doctrine is so important. Amen? Okay, summary. Justification is is a legal term denoting a change in standing in the sight of God. So we stood before him in a court of law. We were guilty. But there's been a change in that court of law. Somebody came and took my place. Right? So before God, we were guilty. Every one of us were guilty. And we're standing before God, if you will, in the courtroom. And God's fixing to lay down the hammer and say, you're guilty. And that means you're going to have to pay the price for the penalty of sin. But in comes Jesus, you with me? And says, no, I, I'll, I'll take their place. And so Jesus took our place in the court of law and then went out and paid the price or the penalty for that sin. And we walked out of the courtroom free that day. You understand? That's amazing, really. So a legal term denoting a change in standing in the sight of God, Dr. David Bernard says. So what I'm giving you is a very, very important I know we're moving quickly, but everything I'm saying, everything we're going through is very important concerning this doctrine. A legal term denoting a change in the standing, in standing in the sight of God. Once we were condemned, once we were lost, but now we're saved and no longer condemned. Now there's two elements to justification. And we already covered this when I read in Romans chapter 4. Uh, the Bible says, verse 3... Now what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. How did that happen? There was a transfer. God transferred the righteousness that's in Jesus Christ to our account. So the transfer took place and then uh, also the penalty of sin was paid. So we see David making the statement here. Verse 6 even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So what's happening here? We see two things. We see a transfer of the righteousness of Jesus Christ to us, number one. Number two, we see that it affects forgiveness of sins. So justification is a legal term denoting a change in standing in the sight of God. 
I would highly recommend that every one of you take notes. Of course, you can go and watch this on YouTube and, and do it in your leisure. So two elements, God forgives or removes guilt and penalty associated with sin, Romans 4, 6 through 8. God transfers the righteousness of Christ to the sinner. So I think pretty much every one of us believe that and understand that. But when we get into modern views, you're going to see how many people debate. What did he actually do for us? Okay. So again, two things. Forgiveness removes the guilt and penalty associated with sin. God transfers the righteousness of Christ to the sinner. So Romans 4, 6 through 8, and then Romans 4, 3 through 5. Now, the origin of or the source of our justification is grace. It's grace. We didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't work for it, right? You couldn't go out and and make a bunch of money and bring money to God and, and be made right that way. It was a free gift. So the source then of justification in right standing with God is grace. Everybody believe that? Okay. And so we are fully reconciled to God, and we'll get into the grace in just a moment, uh, by what Jesus Christ done. Therefore, we are entitled to the blessings and eternal life. To the blessings of God and eternal life. Romans 5, 1, 9, and then we see 10 and 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Say justified by his blood. So we're in right standing because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So it's his blood that brings justification to us. And it gives us eternal life. So we have the blessings of God available to us because of justification. And we have eternal life. Because of the justification of God. Amen. Amen. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath. Shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies. We were reconciled to God. By the death of his son. Much more being reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. So we are fully reconciled back to God. Through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Blessings and eternal life. The source again is grace. Um, Being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So that's where it originates. It's the grace of God. He's the one that took the initiative to save us. Being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. And what that means like a mercy seat. The propitiation is the mercy seat. There was a throne he was on and it was a judgment throne. And his blood was applied to that mercy seat if you will. And because of that, that throne changed from a judgment throne to a throne of mercy. So when we talk about propitiation, that means that God's righteous demands were met. His wrath is satisfied. His throne becomes, instead of judgment, it becomes mercy. So that's what propitiation means. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith. Say through faith. So it's by grace. Justified freely by His grace. Verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith. So grace is the source. Faith or the proper response to that message. Is the grounds for it. So grace is the source. Faith is the grounds for it. It's the proper response to that. So whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith. Believing. Amen. In his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. That are passed through the forbearance of God. So once again the origin of Justification is God's grace. Now, faith is the grounds. Faith in Jesus Christ. So his death satisfies the righteous demands of the law. His resurrection makes his death effective. Faith uh, faith is the condition 
we receive justification. Our faith, believing, amen, trusting in that finished work. But faith is not just mental acceptance. Faith is not just saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. Faith is more than mental assent or mental acceptance. Faith includes obeying the gospel. So there's an obedience that's connected to faith. It's not that, well, we just believe in Jesus Christ and therefore we're automatically saved because of that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian, made a statement. I believe that he was uh, killed, you know. Uh, I think it was by, in Germany by Hitler uh, as a Christian pastor. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer made this statement. He said, faith produces obedience. If it's true faith, everybody with me? True faith is more than mental assent. It produces obedience. So faith that is true faith produces obedience. He also said that obedience is true faith. Which means this. You can't have true faith without obedience. And our obedience proves that we have true faith. So again, faith in Jesus Christ uh, includes obeying the gospel. Now we look in the scripture in relationship to this. Again, you see the courtroom here. Okay. So obeying the gospel then. It's more than just accepting Jesus as your personal Savior or mental assent. It's obeying the gospel as well. So when we look at 1 Corinthians 6, 8 through 11. Uh, here's what it says. Now, there are 10 people in this particular set of verses that will not be in heaven. So that lets us know there's two kinds of people in the earth. There's the righteous and the unrighteous. The justified and the non-justified. The saved and the lost. So what Jesus Christ did does not mean that everybody's going to be saved. There has to be a response to what he did and an obedience to the gospel. Because as I said, there are 10 people recorded in these passages that will not be in heaven. Now that doesn't mean that God predestined individuals to go to hell. What he did was he predestined certain lifestyles. So he says if you live this way, this lifestyle is predestined to go to a certain place. Not the individual. He doesn't want us to be lost. So he predestined certain lifestyles that will be in hell. That if a person lives this way, they will not be saved. Even though Jesus Christ died on the cross, it hasn't been appropriated to their life. Therefore, they will not be in heaven. So we see uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 8 through 11. Now you do wrong and defraud, defraud and that your brethren... Know ye not that the unrighteous, I ah, see, the unrighteous, those that are not justified, those that are not right with God, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Y'all know what effeminate is, right? Uh, effeminate is a man who is, who is like a woman. Who acts like a woman. Okay. So again verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's homosexuality. Praise the Lord. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. So we used to be in that crowd of ten, ten people, right, that would not be in heaven. So before you got justified, before you got born again, 
And before I did, this is what was going to happen to us. We were not going to be in heaven. Now, isn't it interesting today that people live in these lifestyles and still think they're going to heaven? Bible's very clear. But he says, and such were some of you, that's past, but you're washed. So we're obeying the gospel. You're washed. What does that mean? Does that mean you went to the bathroom and washed your hands or you took a bath? No, the word washed here, biblically defined, means baptism. Okay? So we're justified because we obeyed the gospel. And obeying the gospel, we were washed. We were water baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every theologian that you study, doesn't matter what they believe about justification, every one of them will say that the washing here is baptism in water. And such were some of you, but you're washed... Amen. But you are sanctified, set apart, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. So baptism or washed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit, amen, of our God. All right, that one might not have made it on there. But anyway, that's what it says. All right, praise the Lord. So this tells us then how we become justified is by obeying that gospel. We've been washed. That's water baptism. Such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So this is the new birth. So then justification is more than mental acceptance or mental assent. You go to the church, the pastor says, come up there and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're going to heaven because you accept him or believe in him. Well, they fail to tell the people that there is an obedience of that faith. Such were some of you, but you're washed, justified, sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen? So when does this happen then? What is the timing of justification? When does a person biblically become in right standing with God? Okay, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So that's the timing of justification. So we start out by faith. We we believe. We dedicate ourselves. We hear the gospel preached. We hear what Jesus Christ did for us. We respond to that message of the finished work of Jesus Christ by faith. We believe it. We make a conscious decision that we're going to dedicate ourselves or be loyal to God. Amen. And the grace of God is involved in helping us hear the gospel. And helping us to respond to the gospel. Because apart from the grace of God, you would not respond to the gospel. And you would not hear the gospel. So he wants everybody to be saved. In fact, let me say it to you this way so you'll get it. He has chosen everybody. But that doesn't mean everybody will be saved. So when the gospel is being preached, the grace of God is there to help us, even though we're sinners, to help us to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel by faith. And faith is a proper response to the gospel. You're saying yes to the gospel. And you're making a dedication of your life. Not just a mental acceptance, but a total dedication and a total loyalty for the rest of your life to God. When you do that, then you're ready for baptism in water and being filled with the Holy Ghost. But the first step is repentance. Uh, You're exercising your faith. This is how you apply the finished work of Jesus Christ to your life. Now, have I read anything to you where it says to come to the front of the church and accept Jesus as your Savior? Have I read anything to you about taking the Lord's Supper? Have I read anything to you about penance, punishing yourself? Have I? No. It's by what? Grace is the origin. Faith is the grounds. This is the means. 
by which we're saved. And it's all based on what Jesus Christ did. So the timing then of my justification and yours is when Peter said to them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That means you're forgiven. At that point, the term remission, remember we taught it before, New Testament salvation means remission means you have been released from the penalty of sin. It also means you have been forgiven. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Again, now the timing. So Romans 8 and 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the what? Spirit. So our sins are remitted at baptism. The penalty of our sin is removed, and we're forgiven at baptism in Jesus' name. When you receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, same thing, this is also a part of justification. So your sins are remitted at baptism. The Spirit imparts justification to us so that the righteousness, what the law demands, are fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but what? After the Spirit. It also affects eternal life. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His what? Spirit that dwelleth in you. So this happens to, this deals with eternal life in the future. So we have remission of sins at baptism. We have the impartation of justification when you receive the spirit of the living God. And that's preparing you for also eternal life. So justification is at the time of the new birth. And is the continuing basis for sin committed and repented of after the new birth. So God continues to forgive us uh, after the new birth because of what we did when we were born again. Going back to, again, the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, when we become born again believers, we have to understand, again, that faith does not mean, are you all with me? Faith does not mean a one-time acceptance of Jesus Christ. We've already covered you. We talked about Old Testament theology, Old Testament salvation. We talked about faith. You can't just come to the New Testament and no longer teach justification. It goes back to the Old Covenant, Old Testament. You with me? And Abraham was known as the father of the faithful. And he was justified by believing in God. But what does that mean? It was more than just a mental acceptance. It meant a total dedication and total loyalty to God forever, for your whole life. Are y'all awake? And God wanted, God wanted a people that would be dedicated to Him as the one God. And they were to live loyal to Him or faith in faith or faithful to Him. For the rest of their life. So we talk about faith. You know. Grace is the origin. Faith is the grounds. The new birth is the means. We have to understand what faith is. It's more than just accepting Jesus. It means you have made a commitment. That you will be faithful to that covenant with God. That there's a certain, there's certain requirements in God's word. And you've made that commitment to God that you're going to live for Him for the rest of your life. And He does want, doesn't want competition. He's a jealous God. And, and He knew when He called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, He knew that there were competing gods. And when you say, Pastor, competing gods, there's only one God. When I talk about competing gods, I'm talking about demonic spirits and each nation had their own gods that they worshipped are these demonic spirits when you talk about 
God's little G, we're talking about the spirit world that lives above the horizon. You know, above the clouds in the heavens, in that dimension. You have in the earth realm human people that live in the earth realm. But you have spirit beings that live above the clouds. And, of course, they have access in and out of heaven. So when we talk about a God in the Bible, you're talking about their sphere. Where are they located? They're located up in the heavens. So these gods then that were worshipped by the, the nations were false, fallen spirits, demonic spirits. God comes and calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, the land of idols. Because he does not want a competition with other gods. And he calls us to a commitment and a loyalty and a dedication to him as the one true God of the Bible. And we keep that covenant of God and loyalty to God for the rest of our life. You can at some point in your life choose to no longer keep covenant. You can choose in your life to no longer walk in faith. If you do, you will be lost. Because faith is not a one-time experience. And salvation is not a one-time thing. Salvation is past, present, and future. So if you were saved, that means that possibly presently you're saved. And if you're presently saved, that means if you continue to be saved, you will be saved. But you can stop, and I can stop. Living for the Lord and no longer walk in faith. If we do that, we will be lost. Because God is calling us to a loyalty, to a dedication, to a devotion to him and to his covenant. And he's a very jealous God. He will not share us with idols. So when talked about Abraham was justified by faith. It means he abandoned himself completely and totally to his God for the rest of his life. So we see the family of Abraham then. With me? Abraham believed in what? One God. Abraham's family. Israel. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Echad, one. He is one numerically. There's not two gods. There's not three. So faith is in that one God, monotheism. Hear, O Israel, Shema. Hear. God is saying hear. Shema is the Hebrew. Shema. Hear. Hear. O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen. When this verse is read in Jewish synagogues, the, the congregation repeats it. Hallelujah. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And they'll repeat it. He is one Lord. Shema, Shema, Shema. Okay? Again, the emphasis is on him being his loyal, one God, and he's requiring loyalty, complete, total devotion to him because he's jealous. He won't share us. With idols. Here always the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And with all thy soul. And with all thy might. Amen. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And Jewish uh, parents would stand over the, if you will, the cribs of their babies. They probably, I don't know if they had cribs, but you know, you get the point. And they would repeat this over their children. And they would teach them from, from being babies to as they grew up. They would teach them as they walked by the way or as they laid down to rest or all the time. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Echad, one Lord. And thou shalt love. Here it is, loyalty. You get it? Hallelujah. I know, I know some of you stayed up late last night watching movies, but we're in church this morning. And I got you some pretty pictures up here. So what's he doing? He's calling us to a loyalty or to a love, a devotion, a commitment of our life to him. Because he's one Lord. I know you probably don't like my pretty pictures, but it took me two days to do this. I'm not as fast as some of y'all. 
These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. You'll talk to them, uh, shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou wakest, walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Why? Because God wants that commitment and that devotion and that loyalty. And that's why from the time they get up in the morning to the time they go to bed, they're constantly taught this over and over and over. Because God knows there is a, if you will, a seducing of those spirits, those demonic spirits, to pull them away from their devotion to God. And God wants absolute, total devotion from us. As his covenant people. So you start early. If you don't start early, you'll lose them. Amen. So we look at it here, we're going to see faith. The main call is faith, to be loyal to God. The one God, meaning monotheism. And again, we taught this to you when we talked about Old Testament salvation. Everybody with me? It's a beautiful, beautiful story. So how, how are we justified? When are we justified? At the time of the new birth, right? Amen. But God is calling us to that commitment that we originally made to be loyal and faithful to him for the rest of our lives. Amen. Because he is jealous. So what God wants and what God did to get what he wants, Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless them that bless thee. God is speaking to Abraham. Blessing is speaking of salvation. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How is that? Because the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, would come and save us. Praise the Lord. Now the Bible says, he believed the Lord and he counted it to him for what? Righteousness. He said, Abraham, you're a Zadik. You're a righteous man because you have committed yourself to the Sadiq, the righteous Lord. This, is, this gets really amazing, okay? I'm going to go there with you. God is faithful. In his very nature, he is a Sadiq. In his very nature, who he is, is faithfulness and righteousness. So because he is Zadik, he calls us to be Zadik, loyal and faithful and committed to him. When I look at these passages then, I'm moving from the courtroom to relationship. And we see it, it's very similar to marriage. When we look at these things. Because what God is saying basically is I'm married to you. You're my wife. I want you to be loyal to me. I want you to be committed to me. Hallelujah. I don't want you flirting with other lovers. Woo. All right. And you go, well, we're not saved by works. But that has to do with works of the law, not works of salvation. You don't fill yourself with the Holy Ghost. You receive the Holy Ghost. It's a work of God. When you get water baptized in Jesus' name, you don't remit your sins. He does. When you repent, you don't forgive yourself. He does. So there's a difference between the works of the law, which is trying to work or earn salvation, versus the works of salvation, which is what God does for you when you obey the gospel. Big difference. But it's a love relationship. Yeah, we get the courtroom, etc., but it's a relationship. It's like a husband and a wife. That's right. And a husband wants his wife to be loyal, faithful to him. Amen. Uh, a wife wants her husband to be loyal and faithful Amen. to her, right? Praise God. So that's a part of a covenant. And that's what God is saying here. Amen? So would you have a relationship in marriage if there was no loyalty or no faithfulness? Okay? So that's what God is saying. He wants that loyalty, like a love relationship, a commitment. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. It's not that we're trying to work for salvation. Now, so Abraham believed in the Lord. But the word believe, we already talked about it, was a total abandonment of his life to God. He was a worshiper of idols and of the Chaldees. Do you understand that? 
The book of Joshua says he worshipped idols in the land of Chaldee. But God appeared to him. The God of glory appeared to Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees. That means a visible manifestation of God's presence came to Abraham as an idol worshiper. So it was by grace that God reached out to Abraham. Not because Abraham deserved it, but by God's grace. He appeared to Abraham because he knew Abraham was a worshiper. He was just worshiping the wrong gods. And so the God of glory appeared to Abraham and called him out of that idol worship and out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And the Bible says, what did he do? He left. Amen. He became the first Hebrew to cross over. He left the land of idols. He separated himself to his God. He abandoned the competition, if you will, of idols that, you know, he was worshiping God. And he crossed over. You with me? The Euphrates on his way to the promised land. And when he crossed over, he became a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So God comes to you and calls you out of your lifestyle of idolatry and addictions and ungodliness and and says, come and follow me. And you make a heart commitment to God as you hear that gospel. And then you cross over. Hallelujah. Water baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Now you become a worshiper of Jesus, a worshiper of God. A part of his bride. And just like a husband wants his wife to be loyal. Wife wants a husband to be loyal. That's the way God is with us. But you have to understand that every day the world is coming after us. Idols are coming after us and saying depart from him and be joined back to us. But we say no. We believe in the Lord. We made a a commitment, a loyalty. We're in a covenant with God. And we're going to keep that covenant. Praise the Lord. So when you get married, you're not working to be married. When you get married because you are married. There's There's a faithfulness that's connected to that. Right? Okay, it's beautiful. The courtroom analogy is correct. But the relationship of husband and wife is also correct. And again, people get in all this and they want to debate which one it is. It is both. Okay, amen. Now, there's two kinds of people in the world. It's very clear. And I know you probably won't be able to see this, but okay. This verse is pretty small. Amen. But this is found in Genesis 18, verses 23 through 25. Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous Zadik with the wicked Rasha? So God is saying to Abraham, Listen, there are two kinds of people in the earth. There is the Rasha, the wicked, and there's the righteous. So not everybody is looked at as righteous before God. There are some wicked people and there's some righteous people. And you need to remember that. And I need to remember that. Because if we're not careful, we'll look like, we'll look at, you know, say, okay, everybody's saved, everybody's going to heaven. According to the word of God, there's two kinds of people. Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous, the Zadik, with the wicked? Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare? The place of the 50 righteous that are therein? Are you going to destroy the Zadik? Are you going to destroy their dwelling places? Are you with me? That be far from thee to do after this manner. To slay the Zadik with the Rasha. And and that the righteous, the Zadik, should be as the Rasha, the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge 
of all the earth do right. He's a Zadik. So he's showing us here that he can't justify the wicked in their wickedness. But he won't condemn the righteous who are in right standing with him. His wrath won't come. Everybody wait. Now let's look at some modern views. First one we're going to talk about today is Catholicism. I've given you the apostolic view, apostolic theology. And to me it's so simple, it's so clear if we approach it as an apostolic theologian. So I'm preaching to apostolic theologians this morning. Okay? Hallelujah. So I gave you that first understanding. Now modern views. Let's look at the Catholic view. The Catholic view of justification. Everybody see it up here? If you can't, you can see it there maybe. The mercy of Christ is received through sacraments and manifested through faith. It includes an operation in the human spirit, remission of sins. They say an infusion of grace or contrition through Jesus Christ's merits. So they understand that it's based on the merits of Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, they turn around and say that sacraments or sacrifices are also a part of being saved. So there is a, there is a works for salvation that is involved in the sacraments. So on the one hand, they say, yes, it's by putting faith in Jesus Christ and in his merits. but It's always, listen, always connected to the sacraments. And when we talk about the sacraments, you're talking about the Lord's Supper. So when they go and take the Lord's Supper, you know, the priest gives them some wine to drink. And that's another message. You know, should the Christian drink alcohol? Hallelujah. I'd love to teach that. Maybe I will in the future, but... Anyway, so you go to, go to the Catholic Church, and uh, they give you wine to drink out of the cup. And I don't know if they still serve it the same way, but I think they give everybody the same cup. I'm not sure, but anyway, maybe not. I don't know. Hallelujah, man. I, I don't want to kind of clean mine and you know, get the wipey out. But anyway, <laughs> but they, you go up there, and you take the cup, right? <clears throat> and then they give you a wafer. IHS is on it. Isis, Horus, and Set is on that wafer, and that place that wafer, that priest places that wafer on your tongue. So whenever you take of the, uh, what's called communion or the Lord's Supper in Catholicism, they say that that actually turns into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So that a part of your salvation is that you must take the communion or the Lord's Supper as a sacrament or a sacrifice. That means that the Lord is continually being offered over and over. The Bible says he died once. Okay, so anyway, I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm just here to tell you what they believe. So the sacraments are involved or the sacrifices are involved. The Lord's Supper is a sacrifice and not a memorial only. Penance is required. And what penance is, is that if you sinned, you have to pay for that sin that you have committed by self-punishment or by confessing to your priest. So you go to your priest and you confess your sins to your priest. What's the matter, brother? Aren't you glad you don't have to do that? Hallelujah. Brother Ryan, boy, he's looking around. But anyway, you have to go to your priest. You have to confess your, to your priest. Now, your priest may look at you. Okay, you got to do some penance. You know, you need to punish yourself uh, for the sin that you've committed. And that's a sacrament that you must do in order to be saved. Okay? So it is a co- they say it's a cooperation of the human spirit and God. And we have no problem with saying that we must be in cooperation with God. I don't have a problem with that. We also do not disagree when we say that it's based on the merits of Christ. That's correct. You understand? We do agree that there, there is a work that goes on in the spirit of man. 
that's required in order to be saved, correct? We can agree with some things. But the problem is, is that the sacraments being added to that, sacrifices being added to that. So we see the Lord's Supper is seen as a sacrifice uh, and not a memorial. We have indulgences, which were, oh, wow, indulgences? Payment of money to release the penalty of sin. Dangerous doctrines. Very dangerous. Right? So now it's not the blood of Jesus Christ alone that is removing the sin out of the life or the penalty of the sin out of the life. It's the actual payment of money to the priesthood. And they literally give you a, an indulgence, a, a legal document that you have paid money or indulgence. And it's a document of release. And you walk out of the Catholic Church with a document of release that says that your sins or the penalty of sin has been removed by the payment of that money. Okay? Now, if you die, it doesn't matter if you're the Pope or, you know, a cardinal or uh, it doesn't matter. When you die, everybody has to be bought out of purgatory. Everybody, aren't, isn't that sad? Aren't you glad that you're, anyway. I, I'm glad I'm not going to purgatory because I would still have to get out, in, in order to get out of purgatory and go into heaven, you know, somebody would have to pay to get me released from there. And no matter if you're a pope or, you know, a nun or whatever, think about that. There's a certain amount of prayers that must be prayed to get you out. There's prayers for the dead, you see. So indulgences, and this is what Martin Luther, originally, when Martin Luther saw the corruption of the Catholic priesthood and the selling of indulgences and infant baptism, he originally wanted to stay in his church as a Catholic monk, but he saw that the indulgences and infant baptism was not correct and that what caused him to protest against that teaching. And eventually he was excommunicated for that. Everybody with me? Okay. So we have the Lord's Supper is seen as a sacrifice and not a memorial. Indulgences, payment of money to release the penalty of sin. The sacrament of penance, self-punishment for sin. Confession to a priest. But again, there are certain aspects that it's based on Christ's merits. There's aspects of that inward work of God uh, in the spirit of the person. There is the cooperation of man with God. But also they're adding these things that are not biblical. And not, not only not biblical, but extremely dangerous. Now, to the Catholic then, here's, here's, inter here's what's interesting. There is a dictionary called the Dictionary of, of Christianity in America. And when they look at Catholic doctrine, they make a statement that if you're a Catholic, you can never know if you are righteous. Because it's an ongoing process. Righteousness is an ongoing process, not a justification before God based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. So if you sin against God as a Catholic, you have to do something. Penance. Self-punishment, okay? And I'm not sure if they're still doing indulgences or not, but this is the history of that church. Oh, yeah, you get the point, right? Whew. Infant baptism, sprinkling in the place of immersion, prayers for the dead, penance, the Lord's Supper, is a sacrament or a sacrifice and not just a memorial. So you get the point. Amen. Okay. Uh, that's the Catholic view. Now, I will say this, and you'll see it in the last slide. That some theologians look at that and they say, okay, it's all right. Because as long as that central key is met, 
And that is that it's seen as the merits of Christ or the mercies of Christ imparted to the person. Even if they add other things to it, the main thing is that Jesus Christ is the one that is seen as the one that has the merits. Okay? Now, I don't, I'm not in agreement with that because apostolic theology says it's more than just believing in Jesus Christ. It's more than just believing in Jesus Christ. Accepting Him. It's the new birth that's required. And then wholeness of life. So there's some, obviously, there's some things that we can agree with in Catholic, Catholic doctrine, but there's obviously some very dangerous doctrines that we absolutely cannot believe in. And again, the sad part about it is if you're a Catholic, you can never know if you are righteous. It's progressive. You can never know if you're in right standing with God. And I already showed you that as an apostolic, being born again of the water and the spirit, the timing of your righteousness with God, you can point at it. You know when you became right with God. Next view is called the Reformation, the Reformed view. When you hear that term reformed, and, uh, and I study the Bible some and uh, don't know a lot about the Bible, but I'm trying to learn a I can tell you this, this term comes up over and over and over and over again, reformed. Reformed theology. Reformed theology simply means the reformation. So you're going back to what the reformers believe, the reformation. Now where did the reformation come from? Who started it? Well again, Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk. And he never, he never intended to leave his church of Catholicism. He wanted to remain as a Catholic monk. He saw that indulgences were not biblical. He saw that infant baptism was not biblical. And so he wrote a thesis that he nailed to the castle church in, uh, in Germany. Okay, you with me? And it was simply a protest of the corruption of the priesthood. A corruption of these doctrines of indulgence to bring money to the priests. He was against that. He opposed the corruption of that religion and these doctrines. So he put that thesis on the, nailed it to the, uh, the door. It was like a bulletin board. And October the 31st. All Saints Day, they called it. On All Saints Day, when the people would go and, and come under magic blessings from the relics, they would see that thesis. Okay? And that thesis was a protest against the indulgence and infant baptism. Again, he never planned on leaving his church. But, of course, he was excommunicated, and, and uh, so we'll get into that in just, just a little bit, right? But October the 31st, you can see it up here, 1517, is All Saints Day. So the Roman Catholic Church took Halloween, All Hallows Eve, and put a Christian name on it. Uh, praise the Lord. And called it All Saints Day. So October the 31st. It's October the 31st, and we just happen to be here on All Saints Day. So October 31st, 1517, All Saints Day, the customary time of displaying church relics. His people came supposedly to be blessed by the magical relics. They stopped to read the thesis. Now, this is coming from Search for Truth 2, Home Bible Study Course. So, it, when you teach home, home Bible Study Course, Search for Truth, you're going to find a very thorough teaching on church history. Okay? So, you already know this because you teach that Bible study. I love to poke at y'all. <laughs> but the only way I knew that it was there is because I taught it before, right? Okay. So October 31st, 1517, All Saints Day, the customary time of displayed, displaying church relics. His people came supposedly to be blessed by the magical relics. They stopped to read the thesis. Now, what are relics? It might be a bone of a so-called previous saint that had died, you know. They got a finger bone or 
may be a splinter off the cross of Jesus or the nail, you know, from the cross of Jesus, just some kind of relic that they believed that would put some kind of blessing magically on the people. So here they come, right? It's All Saints Day. God bless all of you for who are here today and All Saints Day. No, I'm being honest with you. It's Halloween on a Sunday. Okay, so if you were a part of that system, then you would go and, hey, there's the bone of uh, Saint whoever. Okay? And, <laughs> or there's the splinter off the cross or there's the nail. Yeah. And you walk out and you feel like you've been magically blessed by the relics. So he's a pretty smart monk. He nailed that thesis to that castle church to be read by the people as they went to be blessed by the magic relics. Uh, that castle church was in Wittenberg, Germany. Uh, Luther attacked uh, the sale of indulgences. And then June the 15th, 1520, so it's about two years or so, Pope Leo X signed the bull. It's a document excommunicating Luther for standing in the way of the Catholic faith. Luther's books were to be burned. In that document, his books were to be burned, and he was forbidden to preach. You know what he did? He burned the Pope's writings. <laughs> And the, pap the papal doctrine, a do document. He burned the bull. <laughs> and he burned the Pope's work, right, writings. Oh, Pope Leo, man, he's at his wit's end. He didn't know what to do with this guy, so he sent him over to Worms, you know, uh, before uh, a council of authorities. The emperor, the emperor, if you will. And when Martin Luther got before the council of the emperor in Worms, he said, I will not recount what I'm saying. Amen. So, man, they were at their wits end with this guy. So he's the one that's, that's noting, uh, noted as the beginning of the Reform Reformation reformer. And the date of that Reformation is given, uh, amen, praise God, to be December the 19th, 1520 at 9 a.m. And that's when it began. Now, what's interesting about Luther is that... <clears throat> You see that term, the just shall live by faith? As he was protesting these other doctrines that he saw and the corruption of the priesthood there, he started studying the Bible. He noticed the Bible said the just shall live by faith. It's not by works that we have done, but according to his grace he saved us. And it has jumped off the page to Martin Luther. He said, hey, we shouldn't be doing all of these things that the Catholic Church is doing, Right? So he started teaching that just shall live by faith. That we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work. And that just jumped off the page. It was so liberating for him. It freed him, you know. Amen. Now he thought he's going to be able to continue in his Catholic church. But they excommunicated him as we've seen. Right? The interesting thing about Martin Luther is that. He not only believed in, listen carefully, to being justified by believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did. But Martin Luther, because I used to be a Lutheran. Martin Luther believed that baptism was essential to salvation. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So again, I'm not bashing the Lutheran church or anything like that. Uh, but they haven't taken it far enough. But we're, we're moving the right direction now. Hallelujah. We're, we're breaking free from the Roman Catholic doctrine here. And uh, through Martin Luther, you understand, the just shall live by faith. And uh, the standing up against the religious corruption that was in the church. And the indulgences and infant baptism and all of that. And so now he's excommunicated. Forbidden to preach. He burns the Pope's document, the bull, and he burns the Pope's writings, and he goes merrily on his way. How are you with me? Man, and affected the world. But we're moving, gradually moving progressively back in the right direction. You with me? And that's the way church history is. It's moving progressively from the corruption back to the full truth, as seen 
in the apostolic church Amen. on the day of Pentecost. The apostolic church on the day of Pentecost is the prototype. It's the pattern. If you want to know if you're in the right church, you look at the book of Acts, the apostolic church, and it's the pattern for a true church of Jesus Christ. And progressively through history, with Luther breaking free from that and the Reformation, the church is gradually moving step by step, truth by truth, back to that original prototype of the apostolic church. Give God praise in the house. But again, he did believe in the just shall live by faith. We do too. That's Bible. We're not in disagreement with that. That's Bible. But that's the starting point. Okay, amen. Following Martin Luther, I'll get into that in just a minute. This goes to my mind. Yeah, okay. A man by the name of John Calvin. Now, John Calvin, when you talk about the Reformation, what kind of churches are you talking about? Lutheran church, Presbyterian church, many Baptist churches are in the Reformed theology. Okay? Now, again, we do believe what Luther believed, the just shall live by faith. No problem, right? Everybody with me at this point? Okay. John Calvin comes along. He is a lawyer in France. Uh, Dr. David Bernard said this about him. He said he was a remarkable man. But his theology is dangerous. Now, he did believe, like Martin Luther, that the just shall live by faith and that there is an imputation of God's righteousness through, to us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. But there was a theology that he was promoting called predestination that was extremely dangerous. And then later theologians looked at his teaching and called it a tulip. And we'll explain the tulip in just a minute. So, John Calvin, following Luther in history, a remarkable man. Uh, he started a Christian, Christian institution. He originally was in France. He moved to Geneva, Switzerland. You with me? So he is considered one of the reformers. He started this college, if you will, an institute of religion for ministers that are going to preach. And, uh, uh, whoo. His teaching influenced the world. But let me explain something to him about him. He did believe that through faith in Jesus Christ alone that we are uh, receive justification. The problem is, is that he did not believe. As a reformer, now really listen, Lutheran theology, Baptist theology in some cases, Presbyterian theology in some cases, with me? Where did they get this idea that speaking in tongues is no longer for us today? Where do they get this idea that the gifts of the Spirit are no longer for us today? It came from Calvin. Because John Calvin did not believe in speaking in tongues or the gifts of the Spirit. So that's why you see that in that Reformed Reformation group of people, uh, the teachings that they have. You talk to a Baptist, they don't believe you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. And they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. That came from John Calvin. Another thing, though, that's very interesting about John Calvin. Are y'all ready for this? Okay. If your uppers fall out, just pick them up and put them back in your mouth. Okay. See, mine are fastened, so I don't spit them at you. Hallelujah. But John Calvin, uh, this reformer, again, who does not believe in speaking in tongues or the gifts of the Spirit, when he went to Geneva, Switzerland, when he moved there, he got close to the authorities there. Now, he taught holiness. And what did he teach? He said, no makeup, no jewelry, no extravagant dress. Are you with me? And if you violated those, you would be put in jail. I mean, you know, people think I'm radical. Hallelujah. Say, no, my pastor is not radical. You, John Calvin used to put people in jail. You know, 
if they didn't walk that walk. And brothers and sisters, John Calvin was so effective in preaching holiness that he put the jewelers out of business. And they started making watches. That's why Swiss watches are in such high demand. You can give John Calvin thanks for that. You with me? And so he would say that you know, how you would know if you were really right in right standing with God is that you would, listen, you would have the proof of that in your life. You wouldn't wear makeup. You wouldn't wear jewelry. Amen. You wouldn't wear extravagant clothes. You would long to pray. Amen. You would long to live holy. You would bring your tithes to the Lord. And he said that is, when he preached to his congregation, he said these are some of the proofs that you are justified by faith. And if you don't do them, you're going to jail. <laughs> I like him. Hallelujah. He's a remarkable man in some, in some ways. So, hallelujah. So, if you got a Swiss watch on this morning, now you know why. John Calvin. So, uh, anyway... In France, he wrote a catechism, an explanation of the fundamental teachings of the Protestant faith. Moving to Geneva, Switzerland, Calvin established the first Protestant university. He's connected a lot with, again, the Presbyterian movement. Uh, Calvin's teaching had international influence upon the Protestant movement. He taught that, here's the problem though, he taught the doctrine of predestination. God decrees who shall be saved and who shall be condemned. Okay, and I'll stop right there for a moment. Predestination. That God, before everybody was born, predetermined this person's going to be saved or this person's going to be lost. And there's nothing that the person can do to change that. If you are predestined by God to be saved, you will be saved. Without any of your involvement. If you are predestined by God to go to hell, you will go to hell no matter what you do. No matter if you meet the qualifications or not. You are predestined by God before you were ever born. And only God knows who that is to either be saved or be lost. Are you with me? Wow. Now, John Calvin wasn't the first one. That taught unconditional election. The Gnostics before him taught unconditional election. Now when you teach your search for truth Bible study number two, not one. And I like one because it helps the, you know, to win souls because you're giving them basics. But with, if you want to take it to another level, you, you teach them search for truth too, too. And in search for truth too, as you look at the history of the church... There's a group of people called the Gnostics. And these Gnostics claim to have some secret knowledge that nobody else had. And the Gnostics, of course, were heretics. And the Gnostics taught predestination. So it didn't originate with Calvin. It was taught by the Gnostics. And then not only by the Gnostics, but it was also embraced by Martin Luther. He believed in predestination as well. Okay? So there's a problem with that. Because the Bible doesn't teach that God predestines certain people to heaven and certain people to hell. He predestines salvation. He pre predestines the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's no, nothing anybody could do to stop what Jesus Christ would do. The plan, the work of the cross, who he was. That's predestined. And salvation, the plan of salvation, is predestined by God. The church is predestined by God, but not the individual. That's extremely important. That means the individual has a part in choosing the gospel. 
they're not predestined to heaven or hell before they're even born. You understand what I just said? So if Jesus Christ's work is predestined and salvation and the plan of salvation is predestined and the church is predestined. If I am walking in what he did, the new birth experience and the church because it's predestined for glory. If I'm in the church and remain in the church. If I'm in the church and remain in the church because it's predestined to glory, I will be in glory. Praise the Lord. So it's not the individual predestination. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says the grace of God, Titus 2.11, the grace of God has appeared to all men. Teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. So it didn't just appear to a certain people. You with me here? Okay. But it did not originate with him. Hallelujah. Now just very quickly, what does the Bible say about about the individual predestination. Let's go over to John 6, 44. You know what? I'm not going to turn there. I'll go to Hebrews 3, 14. But you know what John 6, 44 says, right? No man can come to God except the Spirit draw him. Okay? You with me? Now somebody says, okay, see, there it is. It's completely based on the sovereignty of God, His choice as to who will be saved and who will be lost. Only, the, only those that the Spirit draws can come to God. That is correct. That's what the Bible says. But God draws everybody at some point. And then they say John 15. Jesus talked about those that He had chosen. See, so they say, predestined say, see, it's only those that are chosen. Well, he spoke that to his apostles when he said that. It may mean chosen to an apostleship, not to salvation. But if it does mean salvation, he chose everybody to be saved. It doesn't mean everybody will be saved, but he chose sovereignly to save everybody, not just a select few. Now, what I just said to you is so important no man can come to God except the spirit control him so God decrees who shall be saved who shall be condemned is predestination however neither God or man assumes total control for salvation John 6 44 no man can come to God except the spirit draw him Hebrews 3 14 says this for we are made partakers of Christ if If, so we have God, amen, John 6, 44, drawing man. But we have the if here. That's the human responsibility. For we are made partakers of Christ if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Okay. Everybody with me? So again, John Calvin believed in the imputation of righteousness, right standing with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ, but predestination was a part of his his teaching. This doctrine was adopted by Luther, but he did not originate it. It came from the Gnostics. The Reformed view then, as we look at it, particularly through faith in Jesus Christ alone, God declares a person in right relationship with him through imputation. Or there's an impartation of that righteousness or transfer of that, correct? But here's the key, through faith alone. That all you have to do is accept or believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. Okay? Are you with me? And when you do that, your standing before God is affected What is important in Reformed theology is your standing, not a new nature. So through faith in Jesus Christ alone, God declares a person in right relationship with him through imputation. It's a legal term. Well, he was a law, you can understand. And it's a biblical term as well, I read to you already in Romans 4. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the law 
unlike Catholic faith, it is not a pro process. Amen. A new standing, not a new nature, is what is important in Reformed theology. Am I putting you all to sleep? Okay. And that's coming out of the Dictionary of Christianity in America. So again, through faith alone. And you've been to churches probably like that where they say all you got to do is just uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ and you're saved and you're going to heaven, right? Well, what about obeying the gospel of repentance, of being baptized in water in Jesus' name, being filled with the Holy Ghost, and holiness of life? Where, where does that come in if it's all? Then if that were the case, all you have to do is accept Jesus as your Savior or believe in Him. There's no need to be baptized, no need to repent, no need to be baptized, no, be, no need to receive the Holy Ghost if that's all you need. So there, we do believe it's by faith in Jesus Christ, but we do not believe that's all you need. Okay? In the sense that there is works of salvation that that faith will produce. Not that you're trying to work for heaven. Okay? Everybody with me? So a new standing, not a new nature is... Uh, what they believe. We have a right standing. You don't have to have the Holy Ghost evidently. Uh, but that's the Reformed view. Now, in Reformation, there's what's called the tulip. And I don't mean a flower like this pretty picture up here, but I, I have to give you all pretty pictures, you know, to keep your attention. Amen. And, and not only that, I like to find pretty pictures and upload them because it makes me feel like I'm doing a professional PowerPoint. <laughs> you go, yeah, man. woo, woo. I'm sorry. <laughs> so when, when I talk about a tulip, I'm not talking about a flower. I'm talking about, and this is really well known. Now listen to me. This is so important because Calvinism, the tulip, is creeping into Pentecost right now. And the question is, can you be saved in believing tulip or not? Well, let's say you're baptized in his name, filled with the Holy Ghost, walking in holiness. Uh, that's what would save you, right? So you might believe in some of the, the, the tulip doctrines or, or think you believe in it, but they're not consistent with being an apostolic theologian. So at some point, because there's, they're not consistent with apostolic theology, biblical theology, you would have to get rid of them. But I'm trying to tell you, brothers and sisters, before I teach it to you, that this tulip doctrine is beginning to creep into the Pentecostal church. And it's dangerous. Okay, what is it? Tulip. First letter of each statement. So we have number one, tulip. Total depravity of man. And so Calvin taught the total depravity of man. Now, what does that mean, T in tulip? It means that he taught that man was incapable of pursuing God. Because we have a fallen sin nature, we are incapable of pursuing God. So there is no human element in salvation. There's no need for a response of faith. There's no need. Yeah, in a sense there is, but it's not based on you. It's based on God doing it. You don't really have a part. Okay. So again, total depravity. That because man is so evil and so wicked, man would never make the right choice and be saved. The problem is that. The Bible says that we choose, that we believe. The Bible says you can choose. The Bible says that we can choose. The Bible says we can believe. And the grace of God has appeared unto all men. So yes, we believe that we are, you know, depraved, that we have a fallen sin nature. But we also believe, here's the counter, that the grace of God shows up in the person's life. God's grace, His enabling power, and His unmerited favor shows up to enable us to make the right choice. 
So you're not always, based on his theology, always going to make the wrong choice no matter what. Because the grace of God is always going to be there for you and I to make the right choice. So total depravity of man incapable of pursuing God is not correct. Amen. God tells us that every man has the ability to make a choice. Everybody. Amen. All right. The you. Unconditional election. That's the predestination I was talking to you about of the individual. And that is that God chooses us to salvation rather than we choosing him. And, I, and that's, that's a uh, definite. Now, did the Bible teach that? No, it says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Even in the law covenant, I've set before you this day. Amen. Blessing and cursing. Choose you. Choose the blessing. So the Bible is very clear that man has a choice. That man, you, everybody here, according to the Bible, have a human will that you can exercise and believe. So unconditional election, God chooses salvation rather than we choose in him. Again, that's predestination. So no matter what you want, if you want to be saved, you can't be saved. If God has already determined before you were born, you're going to be lost. Okay? It's all based on God's choice. You with me? So again, it's unconditional election. We believe in election, but not unconditional election. The third one, limited atonement. Christ's death only provides salvation for those who God chooses. That means that God did not die for the sins of the world. He only died for those that he predestined. Now, the Bible is very clear that he died for the sins of the world. Okay? Not just a select few. And I, I don't know about you, but I thank God that this doctor is not correct. Because if you were already predetermined before birth and only God knows it to be lost, there's absolutely nothing you can do to be saved. You have no choice. Okay? So again, uh, we're in the L, T-U-L, limited atonement. Christ's death only provides salvation for those who God chooses. Irresistible grace. Those who God chooses will ultimately, unfailing, come to faith. And that means they don't have a choice in the matter. That if God chose you before you were born, you're going to eventually, without your even ability to make a choice to do that, you will come to faith. Again, the Bible is very clear that you choose to believe. You choose to walk with God. You choose to be saved. Okay, amen? And the last one in TULIP, okay, T-U-L-I and then P, perseverance of the saints. This is once saved, always saved. So there's certain churches, Reformation churches that say, once you get saved, you can't lose your salvation at all. The perseverance of the saints. And that is, will ultimately and unceasingly and completely reach ultimate salvation. And you don't even have a choice in the matter. Okay, everybody with me? Perseverance of the saints. Unconditional, eternal security. The Bible is very, very, very clear that... To walk in faith, you are living a life of obedience to the covenant. The Bible is very clear that the same choice that you made to believe and be born again and walk in covenant with God, you have still the ability to say, I no longer i am going to walk in faith and keep covenant with God. If you do that, you are making a choice and you will be lost. Now, brothers and sisters, listen to me. I'm telling you, some of this is creeping into the Pentecostal church. For example, if you walk out, you leave the church, you decide to go for the world, right? And uh, you're no longer living for the Lord, no longer living holy before God. And you're living all kinds of, you know, immorality and sinful lifestyles like you used to do. You return like the dog to the vomit. 
Here's the problem. Because of this theology, this Reformed theology has affected even Pentecost. So that some people have this idea, it doesn't matter what they do, they're going to be saved automatically. They can live in immorality and they're still going to heaven. Now, the book of Jude talks about preachers, ministers. They begin to preach grace as a license for sin. And God says to those preachers, you will be in hell. Because you are corrupting the gospel. It's not that the preacher himself is predetermined to hell. But it's that lifestyle of ungodliness and lust. That the preacher says is okay because the grace of God covers it. That lifestyle is already predetermined by God to be in hell. Not the individual. So that this idea of the perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved, and you and I can go and live and do whatever we want to do and just give ourselves to the lust of the flesh and ungodliness and immorality is not in the Bible. You can choose to walk away from the covenant of God, and when you do, you will be lost. And it doesn't mean that you were predestined to do that. It was a choice that you made. But I'm telling you, these doctrines are coming into Pentecost, and they're dangerous. That's why oftentimes people that are in Pentecost, they get satisfied, you know. And, well, the grace of God covers it, so I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm not going to be lost. And no matter what I do, no matter how I live, God's going to take me to heaven. That's that doctrine. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches a devotion, an abandonment to God, a lifestyle live, loyalty to Him. Amen? The grace of God, what does it teach us? To deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly and righteously in this present world. Heavy, heavy, heavy. What good is it for me to stand up and tell you you can live however you want to and you're going to heaven. And you're going to hell. Okay? If, see, brothers and sisters, this tulip takes away the need for faith. It takes away the need for baptism in Jesus' name. The infilling of the Holy Ghost. Repentance. It takes away the need of living a holy life. If it doesn't matter how you live. then why does the Bible teach that it doesn't matter? Okay? Yeah. Jesus talked about the five wise and five foolish virgins. There's some people at the church, they come to church and they let the oil run out a long time ago. But they're still going to heaven. No need to pray. But even in, in this, what's interesting, even though Calvin presented this teaching, he said, so when, when his congregation looked at it, how do we know if we are predestined for salvation? And Calvin would say, interestingly enough, it doesn't matter how you live. And he said, if you are truly the elect of God, the unconditional elect of God, you will not wear makeup. You will, hallelujah, get rid of jewelry. You will not dress extravagantly. You will live holy before God. You will long to pray. You will long to live a holy life. And they say, oh, wow, well, we're predestined because we have the proof. Even he said there's proof. But again, he did not believe in speaking in tongues or the gifts of the Spirit. Dangerous doctrines. And I'm preaching to you to let you know they're already starting to creep into the Pentecostal church right now. You, you would be surprised how many people don't believe in hell sitting on Pentecostal pews. And if they do, there's nothing they can do to lose their salvation. It's based in this doctrine. Man, 
That's why we got to keep striving. If, the word if, we continue in Christ. And if we do, there's going to be a manifestation of that by the life that we live. Everybody awake? Okay. So now you get to know the tulip. Another thing that's a problem with Calvin is not only predestination of the individual. I will say it again. God did predestinate, predestine certain things. Jesus Christ, His finished work. Salvation, the plan of salvation. The church. You get in the church. You stay in the church. You become a born again believer. You live holy. You're automatically, because the church is predestined to glory, you're going to be there because you're on the bus. But you, got the, you, you had the ability to make a decision to get on that bus or to get off that bus. God bless your heart. So do you long to pray? Do you long to live holy? Do you long to be loyal and devoted to God? That's a part of true faith. Okay, now, John Wesley comes along. Uh, John Wesley, so you'll understand John Wesley. John Wesley is, he's, he's anti-tulip. <laughs> he's, not John, he's not John Calvin predestination thinking. John Wesley comes along. He is the one who is connected to the Methodist movement. Much of his teaching is also seen in holiness churches. And when I say holiness churches, I'm not just talking about Pentecostal. There are holiness churches that are not Pentecostal. So Methodist, holiness, Pentecostal, John Wesley. You understand? Baptists fall into the Reformation period. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes, and we'll talk about John Wesley's theology, sometimes the, re, re, you know, people in the Lutheran church will adapt some of the stuff of John Wesley, the Methodist, Holiness, Pentecostal groups, and it sort of becomes a hybrid. You with me? So some of the people in the re, re, Reformation churches adapt some of this, and some of Wesley adapts what's in the Reformation churches. It's, there's kind of a hybrid, okay? Okay, God bless your heart. Took me took me a long time to just sit here and talk to you. Hey, John Wesley, y'all with me? How many of you ever heard of John Wesley? Right? Okay. <clears throat> John Wesley's influence is on Methodist, Holiness churches, and Pentecostal churches. He emphasized human free will rather than divine sovereignty, which was John Calvin. Predestination. He said, Wesley said, that the human will or our free will is involved in making that choice. Okay? Right? It's, it falls under what? The next one over? Quadrilateral method. His theology, quadrilateral method. It does have value to it. Dr. Carl Sanders, I believe, is the name of the individual theologian. He focuses on this pretty heavily. Uh, but anyway... Quadrilateral method means, in theology, you're looking at Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Those four things. And there's some value in that. There is some value in that theology. All right? So human free will, holiness, personal and practical holiness was what John Wesley believed. The Spirit of God transforms the life. Amen? Prayer and practical godliness, clothing and address and social reform is going to be seen in a true believer's life. If you're a true believer, you're going to walk in holiness. You long for holiness. Practical holiness. That Spirit of God that's inside of you is constantly transforming us. Amen? It affects our clothing, our dress, the way we dress. John Wesley, again, again, that you can see the flavor of that in our church. Of course, it's in the Bible. But, but the last one, social reform. That means that who you are in Christ, your walk with God, is going to affect 
your community. And as a believer, you seek to make your community better. Okay? That's called social reform. Justification. The focus is forgiveness rather than imputation of righteousness. Now, amen, we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, I don't know why they want to divide it like that because the Bible is very clear that justification brings imputation. It's an importation of God's righteousness to us and forgiveness of sin as well. Those two things. Why would you want to sit there? Anyway, anyway, okay. Um, Sanctification. Down here. The saint will reach a point where they will not commit willful sin. Amen. Hit somebody next to you, wake them up, say, that's for you. (laughs) Amen. So they believe there will be a point that a saint will no longer commit willful sin. Should be correct. We should not be walking in willful sin. And we can live victorious over sin. We can. That's what the Bible says. I sat down with somebody years and years ago, and I wasn't in the church very long. He was older than me in age. And he said, but Jerry, he said, we're all going to sin a little bit every day. Like it was almost mandatory. And I said to him, that's not what the Bible teaches. It says, if we sin, not when we sin. So there should be a desire in our lives as we walk with God, eventually that we do not willfully commit sin against God. That does not mean uh, that uh, perfection, it doesn't mean that we're without error or without mistake, but we will not disobey God willfully. Okay? Wow. Well, the grace of God will cover it. Oh. See, you're under that tulip. Everybody with me? That's willful. That's called presumptuous sin. It's very dangerous. Now, as far as the Scripture, their understanding of the Scripture, they were revivalists. That means they were practical in their preaching. Say revivalists, practical in their preaching, more than academic. You look at reform, the Reformation periods like Baptist groups, etc. And again, I'm not running these people down. I'm just telling you what they believe. Um, it's, more, it's less of an academic approach. Like they, you, know, you sit down and you study the Bible and you... You set out a certain uh, systematic theology, right? Uh, in, in Wesley approach, it's preaching pra- for practical reasons, okay? More than academic explanation. Why pick? Why pick between the two? And I know you're going to sleep on me because it's 45 slide presentation, but Lord God, help these people today. I don't think you had to pick between the two. But you see, again, there's doctrine, biblical doctrine, and dogma. Dogma is what men say the Bible says. Doctrine is what the Bible teaches. Okay? Uh, Atonement, from the point of view of Wesleyan theology. You know, of course, you remember the Methodists. They were called Methodists because of that desire to live holy. Atonement is governmental. Christ did not die to pay the penalty for our sins alone. The focus is on God's love. Why do you pick between the two? But, but they, they seem to, that the, you know, to put the emphasis on the love of God instead of um, paying the penalty of, of sin. So that when Jesus Christ didn't, came into the world, he didn't say, well, I got to die for the, to pay the price for these people. It was more than that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But I don't believe you have to pick between the two. The next view is called the deification view. And this comes from the Eastern Orthodox Church. And the deification view is, now I'm, I see your ears go whoop. It's like your antennas go whoop, 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 whoop. Okay. The deification view is not deity. 
It doesn't teach that you are God. It doesn't teach that you will ever become God. God is deity. There's only one God. But deification is different from deity. Deification, when you talk about the deity of Jesus Christ, His Godness, He is God. When you talk about uh, deification, amen, you're talking about His attributes. So the believer is not deity God biblically, but the Bible tells us when you get the Holy Ghost, you don't become God, but you have, there is a deification there. Because you have the attributes of God in you. Jesus didn't just have the attributes of God. He was deity. You're not deity. But you experience deification. Because you have God's spirit in you. And you have the attributes of God in you. And, and watch this. So because of that. This view says. You are becoming deified. No, 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 no. Listen, I didn't say you're becoming God. Don't. I told you. Whoop, 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 whoop. Amen? It doesn't mean you're becoming God, G. It means you're becoming like God. Say praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. And I want you to be like that. I'm glad you're like that. It's important. That's why I'm spending so much time explaining to you the difference. It's not being God, but it's being like God. So the Eastern Orthodox, this is not in the Western views at all. Eastern Orthodox Church says, okay, because you are becoming like God, that's the reason you are justified. I think, we're ju- I think because we're justified, we're becoming like God. Okay? So praise the Lord. I love y'all, man. See, I'm, I'm teaching smart people here right now, man. Whoop, 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 whoop. What did he just say? Y'all make me, y'all really, I'll tell you what, I know when I'm teaching you, I better have it right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. So when we talk about it then, John 17, 20, uh, the glory, the Bible says, so we are so, it says, so this, again, teaching, theosis or deification view. We are so in union with Christ, we are becoming divine, not that we are becoming God, but that we are in Christ and partaking in the spirit world, becoming like God. We are sharing in His glory, John 17, 22. Theosis, we have His attributes being filled with His spirit. In this theology, we are a Messiah, little m. We are a Christ, little c, His anointed body. We are not the anointed one, but we are the Christos, the anointed body of Christ. Amen? We represent Him as the anointed body. We are anointed, but not the anointed one. This is Greek Orthodox view. Verse 22 of John 17. And the glory which thou gavest me, I give them. That they may be one even as we are one. So there are aspects of this that is correct. I think it does. It is important though where you put it. uh, Because we are justified by faith and born again. Then we are becoming like God. We are anointed by the Spirit. We move in the Spirit realm. And we share in the glory of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. New perspective view. This view depends on relationship. And it has to do because you are in a relationship with the Lord. If you meet certain obligations because you're in relationship with God, that's what justifies you. Okay. Hallelujah. So real quick, I know you're getting tired, so i got to move. i got six more slides to go. Hallelujah. See everybody perk perk up? Like the head sticking out of the turtle shell. (laughs) You know you. ah, Glory. Amen. 
New perspective. This view depends on status. God's opinion of who is right is not a courtroom analogy, but relational. Why I pick between the two is what I would say. As we are in relationship with God, we meet the obligation of God, and by that we are declared right, both Jew and Gentiles. There is no transfer of anything. So uh, we would disagree with some of those points. Amen. So that's new perspective. Now, coming to a close. Many theologians, would you look at the Catholic view, the Reformed view, um, new view, uh, deification view? What was the other one? Is there another one? Anyway, you know all those views. New perspective, yeah. Certain theologians who hurl onto the term, the just shall live by faith, that all you need is faith in Jesus Christ. They will say, it doesn't really matter which view you have. Because the most, what is important is that one thing, you put faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I personally believe that the apostolic theological approach to Scripture, that means just taking the Scripture, amen, is correct. To me, there's more than just having faith. That faith will lead you to obey a form of doctrine. Right. Amen. Right. And when you do that, that puts you in right standing with God. And then you live a holy life as, a, as showing that you are devoted and committed to Him. But it's a love thing, not a rule thing. Right. It's a love thing. So many theologians declare it doesn't matter what view you take. The important thing is we are found to be at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone or loyalty to Christ. That's why you have so much of this in the church of America today. It says all you have to do is just believe in Jesus. And everybody, it doesn't matter. You know, everybody's going to heaven. Because that theology, man, that's, again, that's dogma. But what does the Bible say? Doctrine. Biblically, so I'm summarizing. Biblically, the Scripture is the authority. While some of these views may have value, we must go back to the Scripture. The Scripture is clear. Grace is the origin or source of justification. Romans 3, 24 through 25. Faith is the condition we receive justification. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So we see what? We see grace, freely by His grace, verse 24. Amen. That's the source. The condition is faith, through faith in His blood. All right? The whole work of Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, is all a part of justification. Faith includes obeying the gospel. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in right standing with God. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Again, the timing. Justification is at the time of the new birth. Acts 2.38, sins are remitted. Romans 8.4, the Spirit imparts justification. Romans 8.11, it's necessary for future salvation. The Scripture teaches past, present, and future salvation. Okay, amen. God bless your heart. So these are the resources that I use. Not all of them, but the, the main ones, Dr. David Bernard, the New Birth Pentecostal Theology, Pentecostal Publishing House. I strongly recommend that, that uh, book on the new birth or soteriology. It's priceless. All right? Now, I would say this. Anything that Dr. Dave Bernard has, you would not be disappointed if you get it in your library. Because he talks about church history. He talks about the tulip, Calvinism. A lot of things we talked about, he covers all of that. In fact, if you're going to be a minister in this church... These are one of the requirements that you read. And that you get a thorough knowledge of it. Okay, because we do have a certain list of books that we want you all to read if you're going to preach to the church. Amen. And 
and so and then we have uh, the theolo theology course 103. Dr. Ron Johnson, Logo Logos Bible Software. He's the one that focuses on loyalty and faithfulness to the covenant. Really, really focuses on that. What it means to be in faith. It's not just mental ascent, but there's a dedication, devotion, etc. of the person's life. And he goes through the scripture, Old and New Testament, and proves that. Uh, the Encyclopedia of American Christianity, Logos Bible Software, Search for Truth 2, Pentecostal Publishing House, if you don't have that. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to get that because when you teach it, it will give you a lot of knowledge. But also for reference, you go back and look at church history for yourself. And then Theology uh, 103, same course as Dr. Ron Johnson, Carl Sanders, Logos Bible Software. So that is the message on justification in salvation. Okay? God bless you. Let's stand. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the preaching and teaching of your holy word. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise and the worship. Thank you, God, for everything that you have done for us. You have forgiven us. You have imparted to us. Right standing, justification, imputation, God. You've been merciful to us and gracious to us. Thank you that we're born again of the water and the spirit. Let us remain faithful to the covenant, loyal to the covenant as true believers. Understanding that faith without obedience is death. Faith without works is dead. And that works produce that faith or prove that faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you in Jesus' name. Now